Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our second Brussels Indo-Pacific Dialogue, a flagship initiative uh, organized by the Center for Security, Diplomacy and Strategy uh, of the Brussels School of Governance. Uh, my name is Eva Peshova, I hold the Japan Chair at the Center, and I'll be your guide through today's very rich uh, program. Now, I certainly do not need to remind any of you of the importance uh, of the Indo-Pacific. That's why you're here. That's why we gathered here and we have a long line of speakers to tell us about that. But I think uh, it's important to remind and to remind our partners in the region of how much the Indo-Pacific matters to Europe. And that's why we wanted to convene this series, not only to bring the Indo-Pacific debate to Brussels, but to make sure that Brussels and Europe has a voice in the region, to put Brussels on the map of the Indo-Pacific, uh, and to make sure that it plays a constructive role. Uh, we at CSDS, of course, uh, devote our time to do research, to support the European engagement in the region through analysis, but research is not enough. It needs to get out there. And it is through events like this that we manage to get our ideas out there. It is through the human connections that are built in rooms like this that help us build this collective understanding of the challenges that we face in the region. So thank you very much, all of you, for taking the time, for coming. A huge thanks to our speakers who have traveled from near and especially those who have traveled from afar. And of course, a most heartfelt thanks to our supporters uh, for their lasting friendship. You know who you are. Many of you sit in the front row. Thank you for making our uh, work possible and to make the European engagement in the region possible by that token. So uh, before we start, just a, a practical reminder, uh, this is a public event. Uh, so of course you are free to tweet, to talk about it. You're even encouraged to do so. Uh, do not hesitate to even quote the people that uh, say whoever you, whatever you want to say. Um, and that's it from me. Uh, I will pass the floor now to our director, uh, Professor Dr. Louis Simon, uh, for his welcoming remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Eva, and good morning. Uh, to all of you. Uh, you may have seen that there's a slight uh, change in the program. Our president, the president of our school, was supposed to be here this morning, but he has to be at the Royal Palace, so he will join us later in the day. So just to welcome you from my side uh, to this second uh, edition of the Brussels in the Pacific Dialogue. Uh, we launched this dialogue, as Eva was mentioning, roughly a year ago uh, across the street, and we had the pleasure of having with us High Representative uh, Josep Borrell with uh, uh, to launch that uh, first edition. And for this second edition, we are really delighted uh, to have uh, Alexander de Croo, who's Prime Minister of Belgium, of course, and currently also holding the rotating presidency of the EU Council. And the Prime Minister will hopefully uh, be with us this afternoon if he's not disrupted by all that uh, honking that you may have, uh, uh, um, that may have welcomed you here. So I think the fact that we had the High Representative last year and that we have the, uh, the Prime Minister this year sort of bears witness to what Eva was saying, right? The growing public uh, uh, and political awareness in Europe about the Indo-Pacific region's uh, geopolitical, economic, technological importance or even centrality in international politics. Uh, one of our core propositions at CSDS, and Eva was uh, alluding to that, is to promote a better understanding of how geopolitical and security dynamics in the Indo-Pacific and Euro-Atlantic intersect uh, with each other. And I think that's why this dialogue speaks so directly to our research uh, interests. Of course, we have a Japan chair, uh, which is coordinating this dialogue, uh, as well as a Korea chair. Uh, and we work very closely with many other partners in the region, including Australia, India, uh, and Taiwan. And we're very thankful for their friendship and ongoing support. So in recent years, we have seen um, the European Union, NATO, and, uh, uh, and a wide range of European countries uh, step up their cooperation with like-minded partners in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and the war in Ukraine and the intensifying strategic competition globally uh, have brought Europe and the Indo-Pacific closer together over the last few years. We've also seen partners like Japan, Australia, 
South Korea, Taiwan, support uh, Ukraine and denounce Russia's assault on the European security architecture and fundamental international norms. And we've all uh, been constantly reminded uh, uh, of Prime Minister Kishida's statement about how today's Ukraine can be tomorrow's East Asia, uh, which has, of course, triggered many debates in Europe about Europe's own commitment uh, to security in East Asia, or more specifically, to Taiwan, a country that is uh, of uh, increasing strategic and geoeconomic importance, and a country that is increasingly recognized as a key European partner. At the same time, uh, the proliferation of crises in Europe's uh, neighborhood, from Ukraine to Gaza uh, and the Red Sea, uh, is, could, continues to generate debate about how much Europeans can actually prioritize their engagement in the Indo-Pacific and with Indo-Pacific partners. So the purpose of today's dialogue is to help us navigate some of these strategic dilemmas and better understand how geopolitical and strategic dynamics in Europe and the Indo-Pacific relate to each other. And we're thrilled uh, to have such an exciting program ahead of us. So the first panel is gonna be devoted uh, to the Ukraine war and the future of the uh, global rules-based order. So sort of the big picture panel, if you will. Uh, and of course, uh, a very important topic, not least in light of everything that's going on in the Middle East, but also uh, in the context of the political transitions uh, that we're gonna have this year in Europe and in the United States. Uh, and we'll then move on to uh, two, two thematic panels that are gonna look at the relationship between Europe and the Indo-Pacific with a particular focus on security and alliances and economic security and technology, respectively. And then after that, we'll have a special panel on the Camp David uh, agreement uh, between, Euro uh, between uh, Japan, the ROK, and the United States, and more broadly on the transformation of the regional security architecture in the Indo-Pacific. And after that, uh, our president, Karl de Gucht, president of the Brussels School of Governance, will introduce the prime minister who will deliver the closing keynote. That's it from my side, just to thank you again to all of you for coming. Uh, for supporting our work, uh, and a special thanks, of course, to Eva, to Natalia, and to Paula for, uh, for putting this thing together, and to the entire CSDS team for their wonderful work, uh, and, of course, those of you traveling from, from overseas. Uh, that's it from my side, and I hope you enjoy the dialogue. Thank you. I hope you all warmed up for the first panel. Allow me to invite the speakers of the first panel to join us on stage. I hope you all have your mics. Uh, Luis will be the moderator of the first panel that looks at the war uh, in Ukraine and the kind of deeply transformative um, effect that it had uh, for Europe and for uh, Indo-Pacific and kind of global affairs. So please join me uh, on stage, take your seats. And the next hour and 15 minutes is yours and ours with the war in Ukraine and the future of the rules-based global order. All right. Hello again. So welcome to this first panel, as Eva was saying, on the war in Ukraine and the future of the rules-based global order. So as I was mentioning and Eva was mentioning, uh, the war in Ukraine has sort of underlined uh, the growing geopolitical interconnectivity between the Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific regions and sort of helped bring like-minded, and we can unpack the, uh, the, the, the quotes later, partners in, in both regions closer together uh, in support, again, quotes, of an open and rules-based global order. Um, so I would perhaps argue that this coalition of like-minded countries in support of uh, rules-based and open international order extends to both the security and the economic domains uh, in the sense that over the last few years uh, in a sort of post-Ukraine and post-COVID uh, context, we've also seen European and many Indo-Pacific countries and American views on supply chain uh, security and economic security sort of gradually converge. Uh, um, 
having said that, um, the, the, uh, the prospect of protracted warfare in Ukraine, uh, uh, the proliferation of crisis in the Middle East, which I was alluding to earlier, uh, uh, but also the shadow of, of, of conflict in the Indo-Pacific uh, are also exacerbating debates uh, on strategic trade-offs and priorities uh, within this coalition of the like-minded, and that's, and that's a challenge moving forward, right? Uh, and there are other challenges, such as different approaches uh, uh, towards economic de-risking or economic security, right? Which are not entirely, entirely the same uh, uh, across this coalition of the like-minded, but also domestic political contestation within the United States and, and Europe, uh, or more broadly, perhaps, the growing disaffection um, in the so-called, again, quotes, global south with the liberal international order, a trend that arguably has been uh, uh, exacerbated by the current crisis <coughs> in the Middle East um, that has also challenged uh, unity within this coalition of the like-minded and also within the transatlantic relationship and uh, within Europe as well. So the broader question that we'd like to address uh, on this first panel mm -hmm. is how resilient is this coalition of like-minded countries in support of an open global order? And to what extent can it withstand uh, uh, current domestic and international challenges? So I think to unpack that uh, sort of puzzle, uh, we've got a terrific lineup, and I'm not gonna dwell on their bios because you all have their, uh, our wonderful booklets. Um, uh, we have uh, to my immediate left, Enrique Mora, who is Deputy Secretary General uh, uh, and Political Director of the European External Action Service. Uh, then Maki Kobayashi, who is Director General for Public Diplomacy uh, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, and who's come all the way from Tokyo. Thanks for being here, Maki. Uh, we have uh, Anit uh, Mukherjee, who is a, a professor with the India uh, Institute at King's College London, who just moved to Europe two weeks ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and we have Christy uh, Reich, who is Deputy Director of ICDS in Tallinn, and let me also use the opportunity to congratulate Christy for the launch of the second uh, Japan chair uh, in Europe uh, 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 a few months ago. So <laughs> we've got roughly 75 minutes, uh, and ideally would, would like to, uh, to leave plenty of room for discussion because there are many, many bright people in the room. Uh, so I've asked the speakers to keep their initial remarks uh, to eight, 10 minutes, ideally. Um, and then we'll, 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 we'll have some, some back and forth with you. So Enrique, let's uh, maybe start with you and with the EU's perspective on the impact of the Ukraine war for global security and for international order, and perhaps more specifically how the war may affect, if at all, the EU's evolving approach to the Indo-Pacific. A pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thanks, Luis. Thanks for the invitation and for being here. It's really a privilege in this very prestigious uh, company. The war of aggression in, in Ukraine, it's, it's quite obvious. It's having a massive impact in the new international order. Uh, what we are having is a permanent member of the Security Council, a nuclear power, so-called legitimate nuclear power. Uh, what was supposed to be a military superpower invading a smaller, weaker neighbor, um, violating its border, threatened with the use of uh, nuclear weapons in a conventional war. It's the first time that that happens after, after the Second World War. Uh, bombing civilian infrastructure, residential areas, and annexing 20% of the Ukrainian territory. But we, don't, we shouldn't think that this war is only about territorial conquest. This war is essentially about the principles that will govern the international mm -hmm. community. Um, <clears throat> in particular in Europe, the principles that inspire the European security architecture. After the, the end of the Cold War, basically the basic underlying idea in this European security architecture was that every single country, every single nation had the right to choose its own alliances, be it militarily, political, <coughs> economic, you name it. And this is what Vladimir Putin is challenging, because he has an idea of security, according to which Russia has special paramount security is for Russia. The rest, neighbors, have to adapt, have to adapt their security to these uh, Russian uh, wishes. Obviously, that goes against any basic principle that we can organize in Europe. That's why the war in Ukraine is an existential threat to the European Union. 
That's why we are supporting Ukraine and we will continue to do so whatever, whatever it takes because we are Britain as much as, as Ukraine is. This war of aggression is obviously taking place in a, in a bigger framework that was uh, happening before these uh, different global trends. For example, the most relevant maybe is this shift from cooperation to competition that this war is a, is a clear example. And this is, again, a, a test and a challenge to international order, and this is obviously defining a new international order. If you look at this shift from co cooperation to competition, you have it in international organizations. They are increasingly irrelevant. Look at the UN Security Council. Look at the architecture, non-proliferation architecture. There are many other regimes. We have also this, and the war in Ukraine is the proof, this um, new idea of, uh, well, new idea, very old idea, but coming back again of the prevalence of force, the resort to the use of force, the so-called spheres of influence, power politics in, in, one, in one sentence, which is again behind this, this war. And, and we have also in this shift from uh, cooperation to competition, a very interesting phenomenon, probably newer than the other, which is what people have called weaponization of interdependence. And we have it put in using gas, but you saw it in vaccines, you can see it in semiconductors, in technology. And this is, this is very interesting because you mentioned uh, Western societies being um, not anymore happy about globalization and all these phenomena, which is, which is absolutely true. But what we are having now is another challenge to the traditional model of globalization, which is using economic for uh, power purposes, using weaponizing the economy. So from now on, something as basic as supply chains, for example, will no longer be defined in economic terms and efficiency. No, they will be defined in terms of economic security. So we all will be poorer, but at the same time, it will be the price to, to pay for, for our security. The connection between the war in Ukraine and the Indo-Pacific, there is a very direct, clear, and very worrying connection, which is the military cooperation between Russia and North Korea. We know that Kim Jong-un is giving uh, weapons, ammunition, uh, probably one million rounds of ammunition. He's giving missiles to Putin, they had been used already twice, attacking civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. But we don't know is what's going on the other way around, what's going on from Moscow to John Jan. Probably seems logical to think it's ballistic and nuclear technology. And that will enhance an already very, very dangerous nuclear, nuclear program. So again, this war is introducing uh, very, very dangerous factor of instability in the, in the Pacific. You made the example of, of Taiwan, and the Prime Minister of Japan referred that Ukraine today is, uh, could be East Asia to borrow. Uh, obviously, from a legal point of view, are completely different examples, but at the same time, it's obvious that many people are looking at this as a precedent of something that shouldn't happen <coughs> in, the, in the future. Finally, uh, a word you mentioned on this, um, what's going on in Gaza, in the Middle East, whether it is relevant for the future of uh, global security. It, it, it will basically depend on how things evolve on the, on the ground. Up to now, <coughs> this is just another round of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict for 50 years now. A very spectacular one because the number of dead people if uh, the government, the current government of Israel goes all the way, then we could really have a, a regional conflict and sooner or later a big impact into, into international security. But we will see, for the time being, is, is what it is. I, I will stop here, I think I went by eight minutes. All right, so Thank on, you. on that uplifting note, uh, we, can, we can move I on. Mean, I mean, uh, and they have to be up to it. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, no, so th thank you very much also for actually uh, um, picking up on that broader point about the shift from cooperation to competition and what that means for 
international institutions, international regimes, international norms, uh, and the so-called weaponization of interdependence of everything, uh, I would say, pr pretty much, and also of narratives. I'm sure we'll get back to that and also hopefully to the Middle East, but let's turn over to Maki now for a Japanese perspective on, on, on this topic. Maki, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Over to you. So, okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, Enrique already uh, really spoke the uh, um, entire picture of uh, the current affairs. Uh, for our perspective, uh, uh, the uh, illegal, unprovoked war uh, of aggression by Russia is really uh, the matter of uh, survival of international order, uh, rules-based international order. Um, that's the reason why we had uh, immediately, of course, condemned uh, with the strongest term and uh, introduced financial sanctions, uh, trade-related measures, and um, also uh, the stop of uh, visa issuing and so on. Um, throughout the last year in G7, um, chair, as G7 chair, uh, we have been speaking with uh, those countries who are um, getting some narratives as if uh, the sanctions are causing uh, some um, food security issues and uh, hike and energy. And we've been talking um, throughout the um, past years with all the uh, partner countries uh, the causes are uh, coming from <coughs> Russia's aggression. Um, this year, from the um, very beginning of this year, from Mr. Kamikawa uh, went to uh, Ukraine January uh, 7th um, as a first destination of her year first tour to Euro Atlantic um, countries. Um, in order to make clear that we steadfast. Our, st our support is steadfast, and we continue to support Ukraine. Our assistance to Ukraine is about, uh, up until now, $12.1 billion by now. Uh, according to Keogh Institute, uh, we are the second after US in Indo-Pacific region uh, in terms of uh, ratio of GDP for assistance. Um, we consider that um, uh, we are, we are our Prime Minister went to Ukraine last March. Um, our Foreign Minister and Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky came to the uh, summit of Hiroshima, uh, speaking directly with other partners apart from G7, which are in Canvas, I mean, the <coughs> stakeholders, to discuss about the matter. And uh, we also had the um, Foreign Minister going to uh, Ukraine with business in November. Again, our State Ministers went with business people in order to talk about um, uh, private participation for uh, economic reconstruction. And uh, we are going to have um, Japan-Ukraine uh, conference for promotion of economic reconstruction, uh, February 19th. Uh, all in all, we consider that we really have to show our support, strong support to Ukraine to, to really go through this very difficult year of 2024 in waiting for all the materials coming through to Ukraine in 2025. Um, we consider that if our collective commitment uh, is, is ever in serious doubt in the context of um, Ukrainian war, um, as, as we always say that uh, we are going to um, have influence in other international uh, areas as you laid out Prime Minister's remark. We have been seeing throughout these past years, I remember that we spoke about it in 2015, 2016, there are all these uh, um, increasing uh, cooperation between China and Russia uh, for uh, strengthening strategic ties. Um, well, they started the joint exercise since uh, mid 2000s and uh, uh, after having drills in Yellow Sea, they came to East China Sea, South China Sea, um, Sea of Japan, and Mediterranean Sea in 2015, Baltic Sea in 2017. And even after uh, the aggression uh, to Ukraine, they continue uh, all the drills in air, in, in, in the sea, in the vicinity of Japan. Um, and also, as uh, Enrique remarked, uh, regarding this uh, 
rapprochement of uh, China, Russia, we also very much concerned uh, what Russia provided in exchange for uh, the illegal importation of weapons against the uh, UN Security Council resolutions um, and using ballistic missiles launchers procured by North Korea. And also in terms of cybersecurity, uh, FEMI, foreign manipulation of information interference, um, there's no border and we see uh, the um, very similar activities elsewhere uh, to undermine the democratic countries. And all in all, uh, we consider that there are uh, more and more efforts we have to do uh, between Japan, Europe, Indo in the Pacific and Euro-Atlantic to cooperate together to, to cope with the situations. Um, Luis, you asked me about, uh, you asked us about uh, uh, prospects uh, in relation to uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic competition. Um, I don't really like to use the term global south, uh, except for talking about cooperation among them, because I don't believe that uh, there is a difference between uh, so-called global south countries, west or north, uh, regarding the importance of the rule of law. I used to be DG for Latin America and the Caribbean affairs until September last year, and when we were talking with them, and when we were talking with the ASEAN countries, all of them are convinced that rule of, of law is necessary, not ruled by force, uh, in order to protect their interests. Um, and um, that's the core principles uh, are shared with most of the countries. And, um, and that's where we were trying to uh, agree uh, during the G7 summit in Hiroshima when we were inviting partners together with President Zelensky. Um, with ASEAN countries, when we had the commemorative uh, summit last December, uh, we also announced our strong commitment uh, for rules-based Indo-Pacific region and uh, also agreed highlighting some key principles as well. I think what is very necessary is that uh, the uh, some um, emerging uh, developing countries do not want to uh, be asked to choose camps. And we keep saying that we are not asking to choose camps, but choose principles. And um, we, we noticed that our partners as well in other regions, they also need to, they, they, they are also so aware of the necessity of de-risking because they saw what happened in COVID, during the COVID-19, not only disruption of supply chain, but as you said, uh, the munas of the, of the vaccination, vaccines, and, uh, uh, and, and see all the phenomenon of economic coercion uh, which is happening. So, so most of our co partners who share the same principles are in need for uh, options uh, that they, they can choose. Uh, that's where we really have to make efforts to, to provide options, to agree on principles and uh, not, not necessarily ask for uh, to achieve somewhere as the same ground, but, but just to, just to uh, assist uh, as long as they have the same aspiration of goals, how to get there, what pace is, is according to uh, each country. So um, we think during the course of this year in 2024, as Luis said, uh, at very front, um, we have many elections, we have anticipation of many changes, and we really have to work together, Japan, uh, Europe, uh, Indo-Pacific countries, French countries, um, to, to, to really um, show our resol resolve to uphold uh, the, the most important international <laughs> principles. Some, of course, uh, so-called uh, global South countries are talk about um, another order, but I think it's not, they're not talking about another order, but they are talking about how to governance, how to, how to govern, uh, to change the global governance structure. Uh, and that, that's also where we really have to make efforts. I probably stop here. Thank you. All right, thanks. I, I must say that I've, I think I've started pretty much every conversation for the past year or so on the global south by saying, terrible concept, 
let's not use it. Okay, I'm just gonna use it uh, uh, for a bit now, but uh, this will be the last time. So I think, because uh, <laughs> I got nothing else. That's, uh, uh, and I think many of us find, find ourselves in that, in that predicament. Sure. <laughs> but anyway, th thank you very much for, uh, for outlining Japan's perspective and also for putting on the table the, uh, the Sino-Russian relationship. And um, I'm hoping we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that. But let's now uh, turn over to, um, to, to you and it for, uh, uh, for an Indian perspective. I think it'd be good if you could also touch on India's uh, perception of both China and the United States and, and, uh, and India's conception of international order uh, at a time of, of mounting global geo geoeconomic and geopolitical competition. Over to you. Thank you so much, Luis. It's, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. I've just been here for a month in this continent, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about Europe. Give me another month and I'll be an expert in Europe, right? <laughs> So just give me a month, and then I can talk about everything about Europe. No, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, before I start, just a couple of comments to the other two. I think the Global South concept, I hate it myself. However, at King's, I have to teach a class on the Global South. So I cannot say that publicly, so please don't let everybody know that I hate the concept Global South. Nevertheless, I think there is some growing traction around the world when you talk about the Global South. And in some ways, it's the old, you know, the third world era and the developing world and the global south. But if you were to clump it together, I think there is some, some argument of the fact that countries which are not in the West or let's say in the authoritarian East, and we all know which those countries are, have a certain voice that have been large, not largely ignored, but they have a voice. They have an opinion on global matters. And that includes issues like climate change, that includes issues like trade, that includes issues like um, free movement of people, goods, services, that includes issues like international order. And I think seen from that, and I don't want to do this, but you know all that everybody does it on WhatsApp, which is whataboutism, right? And here's where I don't want to introduce an element of whataboutism, but when everybody talks about principles and what is a invasion and uh, an invasion of one country with another country, I think the people in the global south talk about what about X, Y, and Z. And you all know what X, Y, and Z means, right? You all know about the actions of Western countries that have destabilized other societies and other countries. So that whataboutism is prevalent in WhatsApp group. Of course, it's much more, it's much more, it's, it's much more complicated than that, right? It's much more complicated than a WhatsApp forward. But it'll, it'll be foolish on our part to ignore the fact that those WhatsApp messages exist. Those are wildly popular among certain sections of the people. And they might not be educated people, they might not have the PhDs, but they have a view of the world. They have a view of international affairs. They have a view of foreign policy of their own countries. And democracies respond to such sentiment. So to come back to an Indian perspective, I'll say three things before I talk about India. Firstly, interests matter. And I'm more in, I'm more in favor whether it is relationship, whether it is friendship, whether it is interaction among countries, if we have common interests. And so I would urge when we think about countries, whether we think about engaging them, think about what interests you have in common. And I think from a view from New Delhi is that interests are important. Secondly, geography is extremely critical to understanding a worldview. So the view from Tokyo looks, the world from Tokyo looks very different from the world from Seoul, looks very different from Philippines, from Tokyo, from Singapore, from New Delhi, right? It, it looks very different from Kiev for that matter. Right? If you are sitting in any of these countries, your geography does matter. So that's the second point. And third point is um, rules-based order or conceptions of the world. Every country has a conception of the world order. Um, and I think I would touch upon these three topics as I talk about India. So India and the war in Ukraine, um, I'm sure you all know India surprised some by not clearly joining the Western camp in condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine. To some, it was a neutral position. To some, it was a weak sauce, right? India did, I mean, he did, uh, the Indian PM did speak to Vladimir Putin and said very clearly that this is not an era for war, which was a signal for India's stance on this particular issue. But it was perceived by people in the West as weak sauce, that India could have been much stronger in joining the Western world. And here's where, why did India take this nuanced position? Because it's not clearly supporting Vladimir Putin, because there are three or four different explanations for this. One, um, India's number one geopolitical challenge currently, it's not Pakistan, it's China. And India has this, you can call it delusion, you can call it 
hope it has the solution that it does not want to create Russia and China at one particular time. So if even if there is a daylight of a difference it can put in between th these two powers, that will serve India's geopolitical goals well. Number two, as you all know, India is dependent upon Russia for significant uh, equipment and platform for its armed forces, which is even more critical when we are facing a border crisis with China. Um, as a consequence of the war, India is looking to diversify. However, um, the Russians are willing to share platform and equipment with us, which does not come from the West. So among the hopes from this crisis is maybe some in the West would reconsider the denial of technologies that they have previously done to India and say, you know what, India's reliance on Russia for weapons and equipment is a part of a problem for the West. That perhaps as India undertakes its own attempts to create arms and equipment within its own country, they would be more willing to share technology with India. Third, um, again, India's interests are best served, again, access to cheap oil. Yes, India is doing that so that its own people can um, have cheap oil, but also I think there is, an, um, there is an unintended effect that India consuming that oil has kept global oil prices down. That if, if India was a part of the West in trying to wean away from the Russian oil, global oil prices would have gone up. So that's an unintended beneficial effect of India doing that. Fourthly, um, India also thinks it's probably not good to criticize countries in public for their own actions. And this is a historical tenet, right? We don't believe in criticizing in public because we don't think it goes too far. So that's true about India's position versus kind of like to Myanmar, China, other historical position, right? Uh, so that basically is my views on India, Ukraine. In terms of India, China, US, I think um, it's an interesting inflection point. Uh, as you all know, India is involved as we speak with a border deployment with China. This is a crisis that was triggered in 2020 with the incursion of Chinese troops, which is as yet unexplained. But this has significantly shifted India's strategic orientation away from Pakistan towards China. That includes a redeployment of troops, as well as rethinking its, its own idea about what is the challenge posed by the rise of China. Having, and having said that, it is also, it'll be, um, it'll be too easy to understand this as a purely competitive relationship because there is a cooperative element of India-China relations. It's not geopolitical destiny that they should be enemies, and that's not in the interest of both countries to be so. Whether they're able to achieve that or not is a big challenge. But a part of that, and I think I'll speak about India-US here, and that I think is the most significant strategic shift in terms of the last 20 years, the transformation in India-US partnership. And although they disagree on a lot of issues, whether it be Iran, whether it be Ukraine, but I think the Americans get India's point of view. And so the condemnation of India from DC on Ukraine was muted. Because I think they understood Indian compulsions and Indian worldview. And they understood the fact that India would be a partner for America in partnering in Asia, specifically China. India might not be a partner against Moscow, against Russia. And the Americans are comfortable with that, I think. They would prefer otherwise, but I think they get it, that India is going to be an Asian partner for them. And that, I think, is the most significant geopolitical shift we have seen. And I think in part because India and US have transformed their relationship, other countries in the region, including, I would argue, Japan and Australia, has reconsidered their engagement with India. And that has created Quad 2.0, um, which has its pluses, minuses, but that's an imaginative way to think about the world. Lastly, in terms of the Middle East crisis, again, um, India is balancing Israel, Palestine, the Arab world. Um, India announced the IMEC cooperation, you know, um, India um, maritime with EU as a part of it. Unfortunately, that has got dovetailed with the war, but I think IMEC is still a very solid geopolitical future. And I think India believes in that. It's just how do you immediately work through the current crisis? Interestingly enough, in terms of the current issues in the Western Indian Ocean, India has a very high operational tempo. If you look at the operations of the Indian, like the Navy, there are almost about 12 ships that are deployed there, including tankers, and they're actually undertaking very high operational. And that gives you an indicator of what India thinks of itself in the world. It thinks of itself as a net security provider, upholding the rules-based order, helping carry the weight of the security in the world. Because India has a conception of itself as among the poles in the newly emerging global order. 
And to go back to that, what the original starting point, in terms of the global order, India thinks that being, it is not a part of the P5, but, I, but India thinks that if the UN has to be relevant and effective in the next 50 years, it will have to reinvent itself and get the largest country in the world under its own fold, 1.4 billion people, larger than all EU nations combined. I'll end it on that. No, th th thanks, Anit. Thanks for bringing up the, uh, uh, Indi India's perspective on order, but also for your excellent points, I thought, on the US, China, Russia, India configuration and the robustness of the US-India partnership, which I think is a very, it's a very important factor. Uh, let's now turn over to, uh, to Christy. Christy, uh, it'd be great to have your thoughts on the, on the overarching theme, but also perhaps more specifically, given that you are the northern slash eastern European on the panel, uh, if you could touch uh, uh, also a bit on, on the Ukraine war mm -hmm. and, and its implications for regional security, not just global security. Welcome. Thank you, Luis, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to join the event. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we have just uh, recently also launched the Japan chair at the ICDS, and indeed it is one of the implications of the war in Ukraine that now we are seeing it much more clearly. What are the interconnections between security in Europe and security in the Indo-Pacific? But let me now zoom in uh, to Europe uh, for a while. We have had almost uh, two years of uh, full-scale war in Ukraine. There is no end in sight. There is no quick way to end uh, this war, unfortunately. But a common sense of urgency among European countries has been kind of slow to emerge, that we really need to do everything we can to support Ukraine to make sure that Russia is defeated in this war. In recent weeks, we have heard uh, lively debates in Sweden and Germany about whether it is possible that war will come to us. And we have seen that it has been a kind of shocking realization for many Swedish and German people who have had peace for a long time, that indeed we need to take this risk seriously. And if Russia is not defeated in Ukraine, this possibility that war will actually come to us, I mean to NATO, to the European Union countries, will grow hugely. Um, and we are still kind of in these debates. Uh, when I look at countries in our region, uh, the Baltic countries, Nordic countries, Poland, for quite some time, um, we have been uh, really increasing our investment in defense capabilities, in deterrence. Um, the defense uh, spending level in the Baltic states is 3%, Poland above that. Uh, the Nordic countries are also making huge efforts. Uh, but uh, in the rest of Europe, uh, I think it's kind of following uh, more slowly than that. And why, why is so much at uh, stake in, in Ukraine? A lot has been said already. Uh, but it's clear that this war has broken the post-Cold War security order in Europe. And there is no return to the previous uh, normality that we had. We need to understand that Russia is a long-term threat to European security. Uh, in foreseeable future, I don't see the possibility that we can have a shared understanding with Russia on the European security architecture, because the views on the fundamental principles are just uh, too different. But it's also important to understand how we got to this point and to recognize that Russia was actually never happy with the way the European security order kind of shaped uh, after the end of the Cold War. Um, it never quite gave up this idea that Russia as a great power is entitled to a privileged role, at least in the post-Soviet space, but preferably more broader than that. Um, just recently, a conversation between uh, the president of the US Bill Clinton and the president of Russia, Boris Yeltsin, uh, was uh, made public, uh, their last conversation in 1999 in which actually uh, Yeltsin asked uh, Clinton to leave Europe to Russia. 
Russia would take care of European security. To which Clinton noted, well, maybe Europeans might not like it. But you know, some Europeans maybe answered Yeltsin. So, so this thinking, and it's maybe too easy to kind of um, disregard uh, these remarks as uh, something by a drunken uh, old Russian uh, president who didn't understand. But uh, I think we need to take this as a serious indication of what was the Russian thinking back then. And when Putin came to power in 2000, ever since then, um, the urge of Russia to restore its uh, lost uh, sphere of influence and also Russia's kind of uh, development domestically towards an increasingly authoritarian regime has been a constant trend and something that uh, Western countries kind of fail to take seriously enough uh, for a long time. So uh, the roots of the Russian worldview are long. They, of course, go back uh, not just to, to the 1990s, but uh, to several centuries uh, of uh, Russian empire, Russia's understanding of itself as, as a great power. Uh, the idea that Russia should be involved in agreeing on European security architecture uh, with the US, preferably, and actually the US is the only partner that is uh, taken seriously by Russia and with which uh, Russia wants to be kind of on an equal level with. So uh, this thinking is still very much uh, there in, in the Kremlin. And it is clear that Russia's goals are broader than Ukraine. It is about principles, as, as was uh, mentioned by, by the previous speaker. And uh, it is our job in Europe, in the West, with like-minded countries to defend the principles that we think are the only way to really have stability and peace in Europe, to, to make sure that it uh, uh, will not become kind of uh, um, justified or, or it will not become a new normality that uh, territories of other countries are invaded by force um, or that uh, not all countries are sovereign in making the choices of their security policy. And here, of course, we come to the global implications which have been uh, underscored already by the previous uh, speakers. Uh, if Russia is not defeated in, in, in Ukraine, the core principles of security that are defined in the UN Charter will actually lose uh, credibility on the global scale. Now we are in this very grave situation and what has not been, I think, mentioned so far is that we also face the possibility of Europe being left more alone than ever in the, ever in the post, uh, since, the, since the Second World War. The uncertainty about the US commitment to European security is huge. And uh, this, of course, um, underscores the need for Europeans themselves to do much more for their own security, for their own defense, uh, which is slowly, unfortunately, slowly happening. And we have had all these years of discussions in Europe about European strategic autonomy without most European countries doing much about it. I mean, you cannot achieve strategic autonomy by just uh, talking about it you need uh, to, take, to, to get serious about uh, real capabilities. Now, I don't want to end on a too gloomy note. Uh, I want to stress that the outcome of the war in Ukraine is not predetermined. Um, and a lot really depends on support of the Western countries, like-minded countries, whatever way you wish to call them. Um, there is a recent um, report uh, published by the Estonian Ministry of Defense, which has done the calculations of uh, what kind of capabilities Ukraine needs. And uh, 2024 is going to be a very difficult year for Ukraine just to try to hold on and to defend itself. But then uh, with sufficient uh, investment uh, and effort uh, by the Western countries, the next year, 2025, can actually turn to Ukraine's advantage. And what would be required is no more than 0.25% of the GDP of Western countries 
for military support to Ukraine, 0.25%. So it kind of sounds like something that is doable uh, if we just uh, decide that this is really what is needed and if we have the strategic uh, uh, vision of uh, what is at stake. And to end uh, with a reference to the global south again, in lack of a better term, I mean, if the US, the Western countries do not invest more and really seriously to help Ukraine win the war against Russia, then how can we expect to be taken seriously by other countries in the world that do not have as much at stake, let's be honest, whose interests are different from ours? So how can we go to, to India and others to demand that you should be supporting us if we see all this uncertainty about the US commitments and, and the kind of uh, uh, limited amount of uh, commitments of many big uh, European countries. It is, uh, first of all, uh, our task and our responsibility to, to support Ukraine to win this war and thereby to avoid uh, the global consequences that uh, are in our shared interest. Thank you. All right. Well, th thank thank you, Christy, also for for zooming in on on the war proper and uh, and its implications for regional order as well as global order, of course. Uh, but also for bringing up the whole debate about America's future role in in European security and perhaps later, if there's time, Enrique can tell us a bit more about where we are on the whole strategic autonomy debate.